Go ahead and start us off with a word of prayer, and we'll just get started and talk about some of this. Father God, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you so much for your goodness. And uh, as we go through this creation account, um, just hopefully this will be the hardest thing that we have to try to wrap our heads around. Um, is us trying to understand this thing called light. Father, I thank you for how it is that you talk about light throughout your word. Um, that it is true, that it is real, that it reveals things, uh, that it is separate from darkness. And uh, Father, just be, beyond the beyond the mechanics of this thing, help us to gain a little bit of insight into who it is that you are. And uh, I pray right now tonight that you would help me to do a, a good job in describing what is what this thing is that you've talked about. Because I believe it gives us really great insight into who it is that you are. Um, thank you so much uh, for your amazing creation. And I thank you so much for this thing called light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here's some boring facts about light in case you ever get stuck on uh, a trivia game um, or on Jeopardy or some other crazy thing 186,282 miles per second that's fast God said let there be light now I have some really crazy theories we'll talk about here in a little bit um, but this is going amazingly fast and if you wanted to, from a biblical point of view, try to say, what is the maximum size of the universe? I think you could take 186,282 miles per second and multiply it by the number of seconds in 6,000 years. See the problem? That'd be a bunch. <laughs> be about 6,000 light years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You see where the problem is? Okay. We didn't intend it to be just instantly gone. <laughs> we didn't intend it to be that way. Here's our Earth. Stick around. Here's our star number one. Here's our star number two. 6,000 light years. 6,000 light years. From a biblical perspective, if the earth is the center, or wherever the center is, too many zeros, Larry. <laughs> you see a problem with the inherent biblical math. <laughs> is it, does it seem like our universe is bigger than 12,000 light years across? some crazy stuff there there's a lot of people that say well this is number one why the bible is inaccurate we're going to talk about that because the question will come up well how do stars work that's a bunch of crazy we'll talk about that here in a second here he goes this is interesting i don't know how they did this but they took sodium gas and they froze almost froze it at minus 450 degrees Fahrenheit, which is really cold, and they shot a light beam through it, and they were able to slow light down to 39 miles per hour. I still can't wrap my head around this. They've actually been able to get light to stop and then restart it. I can't wrap my head around what that looks like, but they have. That's the, some of the. That's just basic. This is just some of the basic stuff about light. We're in Genesis one one. We're going to talk about light because God said, "Let there be what light,", light. and it was good. Hebrew word just just for just just for Roger and whoever else is interested in it. <laughs> Got the Hebrew letter for for light up there. It is or. This is a or. 
the light or is how you say it in Hebrew has the idea of there's a hand, a gift, a work, the divine or the first in the Aleph and the Resh is the head or the thought or this idea of knowing, which really when I put that together, the first work or the first thought of God, I'm okay with both of those, believe it or not. Um, just a little bit of now, I'm sure I'll have Hebrew scholars disagree with me, but there's something there in the just how what the letters mean <clears throat> of this thing called light. Why is all this important? Well, we've been taking a look at a biblical worldview and a secular worldview and taking a look at our origins, our purpose, our identity, and our destination. And yes, did I misspell the word? I don't think I did. Um, what is this crazy thing called light? We were in the house today. I was looking for my claws because I was cooking a brisket and I wanted to pull the brisket off the grill. And down underneath the cabinet, it was hard to see. And Renee said, Would you pass me the flashlight? So I've got the flashlight, turned it on. We were able to locate what we were able to find. Crazy thing called light. We know some things about light. We just don't exactly know why it does what it does. Um, Robert, you're ready to be bored out of your school. No. Yeah, no it's going to happen. <clears throat> what? Oh. oh. <laughs> about light? <laughs> Tell me something here. Well, I, I just think in terms of when I was at Sandia Lab with all the engineers and all the thought process, that the, uh, the gurus and the yeah. geniuses yeah. come up with. And uh, laser, at the time I was there, was really just kind of coming into its own and now there's a there's a light in a laser that is phenomenal it, it, it takes light and multiplies it by yeah whatever absolutely crazy stuff yeah 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 and light you know a lot of physicists actually play with light I mean that's what their entire oh, yeah. physics research regimen consists of is Hey, let's just mess around with light. Here's some things about it. It's electromagnetic radiation. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> no. <laughs> but when I say electromagnetic radiation, what does electro sound like? Light bulb. Electric. Electric, right? There's some kind of electric about it. What does, easy one, softball question, magnetic sound like? Magnets. Magnets. So somehow if you get electricity plus a magnet and it shoots off things, there is some kind of radiation of an electromagnetic wavelength that is light. And just a very small part of it that we can see. Um, our visible light spectrum is pretty small and the whole spectrum of wavelengths, which I think is hertz, um, wavelengths here about how this is. Uh, light, it's another strange thing here. Is it acts like a particle. There are some things that you can do with light in a particle. And laser, so that laser is kind of one of those things that kind of plays with the direct beam, the particle side of things. Fiber optics is another way that this works. Um, the particle side of things is kind of, kind of, I'll see if I can do this well. Um, I have a, well, let's, let's imagine that I have a softball, okay, and I'm going to throw it at Natalie. Now, Natalie's not expecting it, and I throw, throw the softball, and I hit her in the head with the softball. 
Natalie, what do you experience when I hit you in the head with a softball because I threw it at you? <laughs> Two things. What is it that you experience? Pain and shock. Pain and shock. Okay. <laughs> now I'm going to take a softball that has no mass. You can see it. It has no mass. I'm going to throw this. I'm going to hit Natalie in the head with the softball. What do you experience? nothing this is a bizarre property of light it is a, it hacks like a particle with no mass kind of a crazy crazy thing and then it also acts like a wave it's another a particle that is moving with no mass Vicki, what are you thinking real, real quick as you should throw that out there? God must have made it because it doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> exactly right. And that's why we know, we, we, we can tell some things about light, but the reality of it is, is that we have absolutely no idea what this thing is. We just know that it's essential. It really is essential. Um, and this is the crazy part of light. Um, I, I, I was challenged in high school by my, by my high school physics teacher who said, if you can figure out light, you've done something in physics. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> How many of those geniuses that you met over there at Sandia Labs, Robert, were still trying to figure out light? <laughs> <laughs> I think they all figured that. They had, they had it figured out, but... In their mind. <laughs> in their because, mind. In their mind. Because at some point in time, all we can do is describe right. what it does. The physical characteristics. We, yeah, we can what describe the do. physical characteristics. What it can do. Yeah. And well, just the mere idea of why, why something can grow. And it has to have light <laughs> to make it grow. What, yeah. what in the world would light have to do with it? Yeah, yeah. So it has energy as well. It does. Yeah. It does. You ready for some, sure. play around with some energy and some light and some stuff like <laughs> Why this? Why not? I'm the one in charge. I got the marker and I got, got the board. board. Okay. <clears throat> um, light is such a problem that, uh, <clears throat> I don't even know how to describe it. Light, light is a problem. We, we can manipulate it. We can do a lot of things with it. But light is a problem. Um, we're going to have our sun up here. Woo! It's bright and shiny. Okay. That's our sun. Um, we're going to have... Bill is in a boat. I don't know. This is Bill. He's got his sunglasses on. Okay. He's in a boat. And he's got his fishing pole. And it's a little warm. And down here is the fish that he wants to catch. So far, so good? So far. So far, so good? I know. <laughs> so here's here's what's happening. Okay, the sun is shining on the water. It's reflecting into Bob's eyes, and he's getting a glare. You ever seen a glare off of the water? He can't see the fish until he puts on. Not just any kind of sunglasses. Vicki, hopefully you know the answer to this, please. <laughs> we put on polarized sunglasses. Oh, wow. Polarized sunglasses. Is 
there's a lot of fun things you can do with polarized sunglasses. So here's the thing. When the sun hits the water down here, the water is naturally getting rid of half of the light in a horizontal motion. Breaks it. Breaks it up. It's reflecting, the light goes this way, and so what's coming off in the glare is about half of the light. But it seems really bright, doesn't it? Isn't that still crazy? <laughs> Some of it went into the water. <laughs> Some of it went in the water. Some of it gets refracted other places. But what Bob is seeing up here in the boat, as he's looking down here, how in the world am I supposed to see the fish because the glare is blocking it? Okay. This is, this is, if I do this well, we'll be amazed. I have the math. I'm not going to bore you with the math, okay? I promise you. But the light is coming off, and we can actually chart it. Um, when, lo when light is polarized, it is moving up and down in a direction coming towards you, or it can be going side to side, or it can be going any kind of direction, okay? Polarization gets rid of a lot of this stuff here, gets rid of a lot of this stuff here. The only thing that you see in polarized sunglasses is light that's moving up and down. Because it's moving up and down, it's blocking all the sideways stuff. You're able to look through the glare. You no longer have a glare, and Bob can see the fish. That's the gist on how polarized sunglasses work. And you're saying, but Larry, why is this important? Because you can change the, or the, the, you can change the filter. Instead of having it vertical, you can have it horizontal. So you can have light that's going back and forth this way. You can put sunglasses on at an angle and get whatever that angle is for polarized sunglasses. Now, that's really cool. Why is this important? Okay. Because if I have a set of sunglasses that I have the left eye polarized this way and the right eye polarized that way, guess what I'm seeing? No. This, when we do it in a movie theater, is called 3D. Uh -oh. In fact, what they do in a movie theater, which is really kind of cool, is they will actually polarize it in a, one is a counterclockwise direction, the other one is a clockwise direction. And when you look at it, it looks all, have you ever, yeah, have you ever been to the 3D movie and you take your glasses off and Because yeah. here's what happens. They started off with this. They started off with this, which is a vertical and a horizontal polarization, which is really good as long as you're looking straight at the screen. But have you ever done one of these where you kind of lay back? They realize that this doesn't do any well, very well unless people are exactly straight on with the movie theater. So they started using polarizing light in a clockwise and a counterclockwise direction, which means that you can rotate and move your head and get comfortable and slouch and still see the movie in 3D. That's pretty cool, isn't it? It's just one of those... Huh, I didn't know that's how they did that. But that's why polarization of light is kind of interesting. Now the reason all of this is important is, I'm doing okay on time, is that Bob doesn't really care about whether or not the light is coming in vertically or horizontally. He just wants to see the fish. He just wants to put his line out there and he just wants to catch the fish. And polarized sunglasses help. Vicki, I know that you've done this a time or two. 
What's the difference that you see with polarized sunglasses and fishing and not, if there is any? Mine don't work that well. So okay. <laughs> but supposedly it does take enough glare off that you can actually see some under the water some that you wouldn't be able to be able to see. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty cool when you see polarization work that way. It really is. Um, so, and the reason I want to talk about polarized sunglasses, and now you're going to be so excited when you go home tonight and you call all your friends, okay? Because here's what you're going to be able to talk to them about. We're going to go in now into quantum states of light. Now, I'm going to ask an honest question. In all your years of church, how many times have you ever thought, boy, I just can't wait for that Bible study that's on the quantum states of light? <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever gone to bed asking that? I don't think so. You don't think so, right? <laughs> well, this is really what we're doing. <clears throat> And that is we're trying to break light up into how it works in some smaller ways possible. So here's some things that we've discovered is that uh, this thing called light is a gamma ray. This is as close as I can get to gamma in the Greek alphabet. Um, this is a photon. When we talk scientifically, photon is gamma, which a photon has velocity or speed or 300,000 kilometers per second with a mass of zero. That's the crazy stuff we talked about earlier. Here, this is a quantum. This is a quantum description of light, a photon getting hit by a softball that has no mass, has a wicked curve to it, <laughs> and doesn't hurt when it hits you. <laughs> so far, so good. There you go. Now, what happens with polarized sunglasses? is that it's eliminating 85% of the interference, okay, roughly. It still doesn't work all that great, but it's really kind of doing a pretty darn good job as it's eliminating a lot of things. What I'm about ready to show you, I've tried to wrap my head around, and it's absolutely a bunch of crazy, but it's scientifically accurate it is a quantum state of light and it is one of these things that I'll just start off with uh, how it is that we do this first thing we need is a light bulb close enough for a light bulb does it look like a light bulb playing Pictionary did I win the picture for light bulb okay <laughs> And the light bulb. I thought it was a nice cream coat, but you're close. Okay. <laughs> as long as we're going to play, right? As long as we're going to play. We're going to take one of these polarizing. We're going to take one of these polarizing filters. Okay. Uh, we're going to orient it where it's pointing straight up and down at zero degrees. Okay. So the light that's coming through it, where's my orange marker? The light that's coming through it is only going in this direction, okay? We're blocking out all kinds of light. It's only, we're just getting it polarized one way. And we're going to add a second filter. 
we're going to arrange it to where it also is at zero degrees. So we have no idea how much light over here is getting blocked, okay? All we know is we have this polarized light coming through here. It's hitting this second filter. And guess what's happening? Guess what kind of light is coming through, or how much light is coming through this second filter? Anybody want to take a mathematical guess? Half. Half would be incorrect. <laughs> 100%. Because it's already polarized to zero. This is polarized to zero. If you imagine, if you imagine, I can only walk through these doors, and if you're going sideways, you can't get there. The next door that matches that is 100% of the light going through. So far, so good? Okay. 100% of the light goes through the second filter. We're going to take our first filter that we started off with at zero degrees. We got our light coming through it. We're going to take this filter, we're going to put it at 90 degrees. Anybody have any math, mat, magic mathematical guesses on, of all the light that comes through here, we're going to send it through here, and guess what happens? We have light that's only going this way, and it's running into something that will only allow things that are going horizontal. You have vertical light hitting a horizontal field. It's going to reverse. Close. I like how you're thinking. It's not going to go through. Okay. It'll be blocked. It will be blocked. So when you have a polarizing lens over here and everything's polarized, the first polarized light, 100% of it goes through. The second set of polarized light, guess what? None of it comes through. So what do we do? Here's some other crazy things that happen. Let's see if you guys are picking up on the pattern. <clears throat> we have zero degrees. We have 45 degrees. The light that's coming through here is polarized up and down, hits the second filter. Anybody want to take a guess of how much light goes through something that's tilted? A little bit. Half of it. And you today get the star in quantum light states. <laughs> exactly right. So whatever the percentage of twist is over here in relationship to this between 0 and 90 is a percentage of what light comes through the second filter. So far so good? Okay. We're going to take this second one, which is our zero degrees. Our 45, 45 degrees. And now, guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna add a third one at 22 and a half degrees. So far, so good? Half of 45? <laughs> We're down to a quarter? <laughs> what, do you think, what was that? 75% after the first filter. 75% after the first filter. Half or 75%. And another half difference, right? Yeah. So you're making, you want to make the case that it's 67. Well, whatever half of 75 is. Well, 
Of a, well, half of, it would be 12 and a half, so we'd go 67 and a half. 37. 37. <clears throat> That's reasonable. Anybody else want to try some different math? Because what, what, what happens is absolutely bizarre. <coughs> Robert, you're chewing on something. Well, <laughs> I know his weaponry. Yeah, they de they've developed. <clears throat> uh, well, I'm not sure if it's life, what exactly, but they can they can disable a weapon at, at least a mile away without doing <laughs> without firing a shot. Right, right. And it's got to be with. Something to do with light. Pretty accurate in right. those things, because, yeah. I mean, how else could you disable a, a tank or a truck yeah. a mile away yeah. and <clears throat> and didn't fire a shot? I mean, you know, no disabling ammunition is, but it's gotta be with light or quantum. Okay. Or something. Here's what, here's what I have. Alex, you're exactly right. 75% through the first one, another 50% gets us to 37.5%. That's what we would expect, okay? Um, this is what we expect. Then another half, 37.5%. That's what we would expect. What really happens every time this is measured okay. is not these results. Eighty-five percent of the light gets through both filters. Does that bother you? <coughs> Mathematically, is it that right? We should see this. <coughs> when you add a third filter in at twelve and a half degrees to forty-five or twenty-two and a half degrees, and you split the difference. The light gets brighter coming through the third filter. It's got magnified now. <laughs> or amplified. It, or amplified, yeah. It's, you're, you're bothered by it, and that's okay, you should be. Well, it's just like if you put a mirror in there. Right. What, what does a mirror do to that whole, okay. whole, whole equation? Uh huh. I don't know. I didn't <laughs> study for the mirror, but. I mean, you know, you, you're talking about water, does one thing, but a mirror would be a. Uh, and I really don't know that it, a mirror reflecting anything along here is actually going to fundamentally change the light all that greatly. But here's what we're left with in light. Uh, here's what we're left with. It is almost if to say that, first off, we get, we get a result that is not expected and when we get that in science, what I've been told, is that this is a... Fluke. <laughs> yeah, close. It's actually non-real. This isn't... What we observe is actual, but it's a non-real result. It's crazy. Because I can't explain it. Because we can't explain it. It's non-real. Mm -hmm. Okay, now here's the crazier thing, okay, is that I'm going to hand Robert and Alice these three filters. I'm going to hand Vicki and Roger the similar three filters. I'm going to separate you two guys, okay. We're going to use the same light. <coughs> Guess what happens? Sometimes it is. It's also non-real. It's also non-local. <clears throat> In other words, it doesn't depend just on where it is that you are. You can be anywhere around this light. It's not just in a specific direction. It's, there's non, it's, it's a non-linear or non-local event as well. That's mm -hmm. kind of crazy. Because what is happening, the best way that I've heard it explained 
is that these photons are traveling through this filters, these filters as pairs. And it sometimes is like the pairs are saying, you know, one's photon saying, hey, I can't get through there, but because you're my friend <laughs> or because we're together, you're coming with me. Now, let's see if we can take this non-real, non-local thing about light and blow your mind. Because these things are non-real and non-local, every photon in the universe seems to know what every other photon is doing at that point in time and whether or not they should or shouldn't go through any particular filter. I know. Quantum states <laughs> of light. So we have Roger and Vicki over here. We have Alice and Robert over here. We're going to put you on this planet A, you guys are on planet B, and let's just for kicks and giggles put you two light years apart with your three filters. Okay? We're going to send random beams of light to both of you. Some of which will come in positive, some of which come sideways, some of which comes just this way, and we're going to give you all three filters. I'm going to have you count what's coming through. The 85% is going to do both for both of you. But here's the thing. Because photons typically act in pairs, you guys can get, Roger and Vicki can get photon one. Robert and Alice can get photon two. They will still go through all three of your filters because this guy likes this guy. And they know that. How fast? Speed of light. Faster than the speed of light. <laughs> when not your vet, but That's the part of non-locality that makes this weird. Is that if a photon, if one photon knows what every other photon in the universe is doing, be faster. They communicate at this thing of faster than light, mm -hmm. which doesn't make sense either. And that's what God did when He said, "Let's let there be light." Let there be light. And now, for all of this, is it why does <laughs> why does this matter? Um. Oh, no, 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 here it is. Okay. It's like, I knew I had my pages here. Genesis, Genesis 1, 3, God said, let there be light, and it was, and it was good. And here's some, th here's some things about, from Genesis 1, 3 and on. Let's get kind of on the biblical side of things now that we're bored out of our skull with quantum states of light, or we still can't figure it out. is that light has separated itself from darkness. I have no idea physically how God did this, but he does. If you look, you can look through these doors, and it's obviously what over there? <coughs> Darker, right? Not as much light. 
The other night I woke up, Renee had, had shut the door to the bathroom and I kind of used that ambient light that comes in from the window to kind of make my way to the bathroom in the middle of the night. It wasn't there. It was dark. <laughs> um, have you ever noticed how little light it takes for you to be able to see? Isn't that kind of amazing? Kind of surprising? We read this morning that the darkness doesn't understand the light. We read that in John. Um, here's, the, here's the crazy thing about light. Is um, Natalie, you got your you got your Bible close by there? You got, got mom's one of the two. Um, Genesis 1 3, does it end up with evening and morning? Or is that 1 4? Or 1 5? Okay. Read Genesis 1, 3, 1, 4, and 1, 5 for us. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning. I think the first day. I think it's interesting in, in Scripture when light gets contrasted with darkness. If light is true, if light is good, what does darkness often get called? Bad. Bad or scary or <laughs> yeah. evil, right? Evil. Um, here's the problem, and, and this is still something that, that creationists, it's not difficult for us to grasp. I say that it's difficult for us to grasp. It's just difficult to try to articulate it. Is because on day one, we have simply this whole thing of light and darkness. On day four, Natalie, would you scroll down in your Bible and tell us what God makes on day four? Yeah, somewhere in there. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them serve as signs to mark sacred times yeah. and days and years. Sun, moon, and stars weren't made until the fourth day. Now the question that bugs everybody then is that what did God do for three days? <laughs> He had light. Okay. Right? Let's let's take a look at let's take a look at the end of the first day from starting with Genesis 1 1 going to the end of Genesis 1 5, what all he has created. Okay. In the in the beginning, God created the Earth. heavens. Earth. Earth. We also have not yet. We have waters and deep, right? Darkness. Darkness. Waters. Yep. And this thing called the deep. And then he adds light. What existed before light? In this darkness. Darkness. On the poetic side, these things are chaotic. They are tumultuous. I was talking with a good friend, oh, Matt Miles, who was here, um, did our astronomy night. I was talking with him about it, and and he he likes the preference. And I and it took me a second to understand this. Fluid. This, this, whatever God created was just this continuous motion of stuff. Okay, we have matter. We have light, which 
is really all you need then to create this strange thing of existence um, and this thing called time. Um, I don't think you have time without matter. I think for a little bit you can have time without light. But I think light gives velocity to matter. That's my theory, working on it. I'm not saying that I'm right, just working on it. Um, but here's some other things about this light and darkness, day and night. Um, after in verse 5, Natalie, Genesis 1, 5, we after the day and night, what does God call that stuff? There is something after that. There was evening and there was morning. Yeah. These two things made the first day. Um, have you ever been taught about evening and morning? Yes? A.M. and P.M. A.M. and P.M. <clears throat> the what? Sunrise and sunset, but it's 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 amazing here what's happening first. But we don't have the sun yet. But we don't have the sun, right? Can you, can you imagine an evening? You're just looking out the windows, we got this really nice purple shade that's coming up, and it's getting ready to turn dark, and that's okay in God's way of doing things. You follow this? this I'll see if I can do this well. Light and darkness. Light so far? Darkness. Got it? Pattern. Day and night. Pattern. Which of these two would we consider day? Morning. Why? Because that's, when the sun comes up. <laughs> because that's when the sun comes up. Or, it's, or you can see. Why is it flipped? Why is it what? Why is it flipped? Oh. Because he said it says day. And then evening and morning. But do you see that when you write it out this way, does it this does this not sound bizarre? Mm -hmm. The best explanation that I've ever come across, and I really honestly have no idea what who I stole it from. Um, all I know is that it sounded true. And it proves true when you take a look at Scripture. Evening is a time almost as if God's taking his hand. It's like, oh, all of this stuff that I created, I'm going to hide from. And then morning is going to come up and we're going to do what? Reveal it. Reveal it, yeah. <clears throat> God loves to hide things. And God loves to reveal things. It's just one of the, when you take a look at the pattern of creation, at the end of everything, oh, there's a hiding. And then the next day, oh, what's this? Ooh, what's this going to be like? Oh, I can't wait. Oh, mm -hmm. this is, guess what, ready guys? Guess what, guys, get ready to do. And the problem is, is that we're, we still try to fix this thing between the first day and the fourth day. Um, and, and, and the difficulty is, because cause you'll hear this, okay? I've heard it. <laughs> well, there's no way that this day could be 24 hours. Right? No way that this day can be a 24-hour day. Certainly have heard that story. Many You've heard times. that, right? Yeah, you know, what's the length of a day with your God? Yeah. Oh, maybe it's a thousand years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. That's only good in prophecy, by the way. <laughs> it does say in verse 14 that whenever the sun and moon come about, 
stats to mark days and years. Yeah. So there wasn't anything to mark them before that. But if the day, let's just take your argument. If the day was marked by the sun and the moon, what do we observe right now in how they rotate or how they go around the earth? 24 hours. It's a 24-hour day. Or 365 days. Yeah. Pretty, pretty... We have 364 point whatever it is. It's leap year coming up. Leap year coming up. Um, let, let's, take, let's take a look. So if, if these were created on day four to set the hours and to set the days. Can you, can you apply that to that? Here's, that's the question. Some people would say no. Some people would say yes. I think that this is how God did it. He also did it over there. That might be my little pet dogma. <laughs> you know? I understand that. The biggest problem, the biggest problem in creation is that how do we rectify this thing called day and night and this thing called light? And what happens in the fourth day when the sun and moon finally show up and give us these 24-hour days? I have no problem that these just kind of plugged right into what God had already established. That the 24-hour day was already in effect. That they just, God just, boom, 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 and there we go. Uh, I know that that's a simplistic answer. Uh, and the problem is, is that we still have to, at some point in time, deal with, if we have the sun, moon, and stars here, and today we have to deal with a 12,000 light year size of the universe. Well, Which the, is the sun and the moon and stuff? That's just what he did for our universe that we know. Okay. There are might be way more out there. Are we thinking universes or solar systems? Well, I want to clarify. Well, or galaxies? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because because it, it goes on in, in infinity. Yeah, which is which is an argument. Are there other universes? That is where, that is where the worldview taught in academia has gone. Is that well, we just see ours. We are one part of of, of a multiverse. Well, if we can't observe it, that's a nice thought, but it's not directly knowable. It's really kind of difficult. Um, and so, what I want to try to do here for just a moment is try to say, can you have distances of greater than 12,000 light years? I think you can. You don't think we can? I think we can. Oh, right. Well, that's okay. I was going to say, why not? Yeah. <laughs> why not? Because what we're <laughs> observing in a light year is a little bit different because we often think, well, a light year is, that's how far light travels in a year. year. Okay. It's a measure of distance, not a measure of time. Okay? Now, the reason I wanted to show you this entire thing with photons um, and intertwined pairs and non-locality and non-real events is that because what is being worked on in multiple areas is this idea called... I know I've got five minutes. It's okay. It'll work. Is this two-way speed of light? Okay. Because the question comes up: Well, if we only have six thousand years, we can only have at max twelve thousand light years. How do you get all this light going from one place to another that quickly? If photon one and photon two. can communicate at speeds greater than the speed of light and know what the other one's doing. This leaves us into what is called the two-way speed of light.
Roger, I'm going to put you at the end of one hallway. Robert, I'm putting you at the end of the other hallway. Okay. Same hallway. Same hallway. Roger, I'm giving you a flashlight. Okay. Vicky's beside Roger. She says, okay, go. Flips on the, we're going to presume that we can do all this mathematically precise down to the millisecond, okay? As Roger turns on the flashlight, Vicky hits the stopwatch. The light goes all the way down here to Robert. Robert says, hey, I see the light, right? Amen. Vicky stops what? The stopwatch. Is that a one-way or a two-way speed of light? Follow what I'm asking? Because for us to see it, it has to come back. It has to come back. Yeah. You're always dealing, with the, here's the interesting thing, with the speed of light question, you're always dealing with a two-way speed of light. There is no way we can ever measure a one-way speed of light. Okay? Because this time we're going to give Alice down here with Robert the stopwatch. Okay? You're going to say, go, and we're going to assume, go, Roger turns on the light, <laughs> you see it down here, oh, there it is. It doesn't matter where the stopwatch is, no. you're always going to have a two-way speed of light. So far, so good? Makes sense. I can't just have you down here <laughs> yeah. by yourself, oh, I see the light, and we know how fast it is. Which gives some crazy probabilities of speed, if light is both non-local and non-real, is that, and because every photon knows what every other photon in the universe is doing. That's a lot of knowing. Yeah. It's a lot of knowing. But that's the, one of the biggest things in the CERN thing, which is the great big particle accelerator over in Europe, that, that they've... they've they just understand that this is how it is. Every photon seems to know what every other photon is doing, and it depends. Out his own mission. Yes, but it also depends on whether or not it's being watched. Okay, a photon that's being watched behaves in such a way that's differently just simply because you're watching it. If you're not watching it, it does its own thing. But if you're watching it, it seems to obey some different rules, kind of like Toy Story. You know, because the toys will drop dead when the person comes into the room now that they're being, you know. That's yeah, right. Yeah. But when nobody's in the room, we can do our own thing. Okay. This is all, this is, this is how crazy this gets. And so what happens if the speed of light one way is instantaneous and it's really slow going back the other way? You can't prove or disprove it. And so what happens, because the question is, what do we do with distant starlight? Okay. Um, was it created in transit, which is a really good answer. Oh, God just gave us this. He just, they're really far apart when he put the stars out there. Problem is, is that if you, in biblical creation, if you have a star that appears more than 12,000 light years away and it explodes and we see that, what exploded because it's over older than 12,000 years? makes God out to be a liar if God created light in transit. I was talking about this guy by the name of Roger Perlman, and uh, he, has a way of, he has a way of trying to explain this, and I'm still really struggling through it. Uh, but, but it has to do with the speed of light, and there's something here about the fact that the further away something is, the older and farther away that it looks. It's a really bizarre thing. And he actually contends that, if I understand his reading, what I'm reading correctly, is that there really is nothing further away than 6,000 light years. It just, because it's distant, looks that far. And I, don't, I really don't know how to explain it. 
but this two-way speed of light makes those things fairly easy to calculate. Um, in my last two minutes, in my last two minutes, this is a wet part. Light, because it's non-real and non-local, baffles us. <laughs> it does not it does not seem to follow the rules we expect. Here's the crazy thing. I've written down five or six different things about this, and I think that they're all wrong other than this. God doesn't seem to follow the rules that we expect either. <laughs> yeah. And his thoughts are higher than ours. Uh And the more I kept digging, because I've dug into this for weeks now, the more I kept digging into this thing called light, um, the more I'm convinced that if we can figure light out, and I have a friend who, Matt, really does think that we can figure this stuff out because he says, God created the universe for us to know it, gain dominion over it, be able to figure it out. I'm of the opinion that if we ever do figure it out, we're a whole lot closer to understanding how God does things. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted us to know it, perhaps. Yeah. And you know, <clears throat> I don't care how brilliant a person is, or individuals get, the vast majority that I've encountered will acknowledge that God exists. And they may be as sharp as a tack, they may be PhDs. Yeah. And they could know all this facts and figures. But just like something does follow. Yeah. It's got to be a creator. That's, you know, that, that's my experience with not all scientists, but I think that's a vast majority tend to see that. To, to be intellectually honest, um, Especially, especially with the evolution question and the, and the science behind evolution, the, the math behind evolution is breaking down. Every day is just continually breaking down. It's a, uh, Darwinism has had to be changed several times to the fact that, okay, well, it doesn't really seem to predict that we really have this much time for these many things to happen. Um, and so it's amazing to me how Paul says, in the New Testament, that God reveals himself in creation, in the world around us. You're right. To be intellectually honest, at some point in time, you, you, my observation is you have to at least come to some kind of mental ascent that there is something out there bigger than us that did this. You want to call that guy, you want to call it whatever. Yeah. It seems to indicate, the universe seems to point towards those things. The hardest thing is, is that it's a worldview issue of if there is a creator, then I have an origin, purpose, identity, and a destination. If God exists, those four things naturally exist for you and I. That I know where I'm coming from, I know where I'm going, I have a purpose, and I have an identity. Anyway. Is this, is this the beginning of what you call... Um, Artificial intelligence. Oh, it's a nightmare. <laughs> it's a nightmare. Yeah, you know. Well, as we get more and more yeah. understanding math, and everybody yeah. will go to the, the foundation of everything is math, uh, we, we seem to be learning something new every day. Yeah, we really do. Yeah. And, and Apple has probably proven that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I will say this much. At the end of the day, light doesn't seem to follow the rules that we expect, <laughs> and God doesn't either. Um, yeah. Let me pray and we'll be done. Father God, I thank you for your, for your word. Um, as we take a look here at the next couple of days, over the next couple of weeks, um, it's not going to be near this difficult. And I thank you so much uh, for how it is that you did creation. Uh, I just thank you that your thumbprint or your thought or who it is that you are is wrapped up in this entire thing. And above all things, help us to be able to understand that your word is completely consistent with what it is that we see today. Um, and to continue to make our worldview uh, one that follows your word. Um, thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.